our ancestors or hunter-gatherers, even farmers, are strong by many people's standards, but they're not super strong because, after all, muscle is expensive, right? If you if you build weights and you lift weights to bulk up, you're going to add a lot of muscle mass, but muscle is a really expensive tissue. There's a reason we have this use it or lose it physiology is that if you don't need it, you don't want to pay for the extra calories, right? You're saying that as you increase the muscles, you need extra calories just to support those existing yeah, muscles? Mus- yeah. You, you spend a good you know, 30, 40% of your metabolism just paying for your muscles, just sitting there, not even using them. <laughs> they're very just expensive. Just to sustain them in existence. Yeah, so they're expensive this- tissues. So you, you, you want enough. You want to be economical. You want enough, but not too much, right? So, because so, if you have too much muscle and then you don't get any food, then you might end up dying. Is that what you're well, well, saying? I mean, so the basic fundamental principle behind life is you, you eat food and then you have babies, right? That's the equation of life. Food in, babies out. That's all evolution actually cares about, which is kind of depressing. But nonetheless, that's the That's a the little truth. depressing. Okay, keep but going. That's what, that's what we're about. <laughs> all, all organisms ultimately are about bringing in energy, using that energy to reproduce and create other versions of themselves. And we are sadly actually no different, right? But energy is a constrained, limited resource for most organisms and was until recently, and it's still for many people today, Still the case. So anytime you spend a calorie on, on running, you know, in the morning or 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 paying for your unnecessary muscle, that's energy you're not spending on reproduction. We call this energy allocation theory, right? So so spending energy that's on 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 say extra muscle that is then taking energy away from reproduction. And so we long ago evolved a system to. Add muscle when we And when you it. say take away from reproduction, I think a lot of people are a bit confused. You don't literally mean having sex. You mean something much hormones. broader. Hormones. Yeah, hormones. Right? You know, your, 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 your testosterone levels or, your, or your, your, your estrogen levels, your progesterone levels, and, you know, energy that's allocated towards reproduction. Exactly. Or, you know, nursing, you know. I mean, nursing, you know, um, is, is very expensive. 600 calories a day to produce breast milk. So, so we have all kinds of adaptations to... Add muscle when we need it, so that's you know working out, and then and then for atrophy to occur, to lose that muscle when we're not using it, and that's 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 useful. And that is why, just again, just to make make sure that we're all following, if we don't do this physical exercise, we see our muscle shrink. This is our evolution sort of protecting us and saying, well, you clearly don't need that, so I can reduce it. That's going to reduce the number of calories right. that you need for. Um, your muscles, so actually you can use this for something else because you know getting calories is hard as far as our body That's is concerned. Even though it's no longer true, we can get them really easily at the correct convenience store. Correct. And so the hunter gatherers that I've met, and I haven't met that many because there aren't that many on the planet. But you know, also if you look at the literature, you know they're reasonably fit and strong, but they're not. They're, none of them are bulked up. They're not super strong, right? Because and also they mostly engage in endurance, not that much strength. Uh, physical activity. So that's one myth. Another myth is that um, they never sit. <laughs> and uh, a former student of mine, uh, Dave Reichlin, uh, who's at the University of Southern California, did a wonderful paper a few years ago in, um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science showing that actually if you look at sitting time, uh, they're not, of course, in chairs like the ones we're sitting in right now. They actually sit as much as Westerners, right? Is that right? Yes, because because um, you know, if you're not being physically active, like, well, it makes sense to save energy, right? And, you know, cows, my dog sits, cows sit, you know, birds sit, I mean, moose sit, every animal sits. Why shouldn't humans sit? Uh, so this idea that sitting is the new smoking is, um, um, I think, been exaggerated. Um, the average uh, Hadza, for example, these are hunter-gatherers in Tanzania that have been well, well, uh, well studied. I mean, you know, putting sensors on them, they sit 9.9 hours a day. Wow, because I feel like that's what everybody's been told now, post-pandemic, you know, on their Zoom that they mustn't do is sort of sit eight hours a day. But you're saying that they had to do it quite, (laughs) they had to do more sitting. Yes. Now, of course, the thing is that when they're not sitting, they're being physically active. So the problem is, if you look at the epidemiological data on sitting, it turns out that it's not work time sitting that's so uh, associated with bad health. It's actually leisure time sitting. So if you spend all your day sitting at work, and then you go home and you sit all evening watching television and you sit in your car getting to work and you sit in your car getting, you know, if you never are physically active, then of course you're going to pay a price for that. But it's not the sitting itself which is bad. It's the fact that you're not doing any of this activity on top, which because our normal experience, you're saying as human beings, is quite a lot of sitting 
but then quite a lot of physical activity to live. And yeah. and our issue is we've kept the sitting, but we've also got rid of the rest of this physical activity and turned that into more, more sitting. sitting. That's part of it. And the other is how long you sit, what's called the sitting bout. So okay. it turns out that if um, if you if you spend time in a hunter-gatherer camp or in a you know a, a village of farmers or whatever, and you know, people are sitting, but then they're getting up constantly. They're getting up because of the kids, they're getting up to cook, they're getting up to do this, they're getting up. So the the average amount of time they spend sitting at any one moment, at any one bout is about 15 minutes. Okay. So they're not like sitting for three hours at a stretch absorbed in there. Yeah, watching the telly, right, exactly. So and it turns out that intermittent sitting or interrupted sitting it turns out to be much healthier than uninterrupted sitting. Because when you get up, you're actually turning on your muscles, you're turning on all kinds of machinery in your body that it's almost like turning the engine in your car on, right? It's interesting. You're, you're, so even when we go back to the sitting, then there is a takeaway here, is it, which is that- Get up every once in a while. You might be all right if you're constantly getting up, but sitting for a prolonged period of time- Not good for you. not good for us, and it's yeah. not how we're naturally right. um, evolved to be. Right, so some people have phones that tell them, you know, or their, their wristwatch buzzes every 15 minutes and tells them to get up and go pee or make a cup of tea or whatever, that's all good. Sort of after every meeting, basically, I'm like, oh, well, I need to go make a cup of tea. And obviously that means I can't sit at my desk, I have to go make the cup of tea and, and come back. And of course, if you drink lots more fluid, then you need to go to the toilet more often as well. So now I can say, well, it's really important for my health because a uh, you know world leading professor has explained this makes me more like the way I was supposed to be. Is that is that right? Yes. Not only because it makes you more like you're supposed to be. It's just there's even without knowing that hunter gatherers did it, it turns out to be healthy. Do we need to make? fundamental changes to the way that somehow our lives are ordered in order to start to move? Because our lives are very different, right? And so clearly, we're not going to end up living a life in the way that our ancestors did. You're not suggesting that we get rid of the water in our house and things like this, presumably. Mm -hmm. So do you need to make lots of very intentional decisions in order to try and get closer to sort of the way that we need to live in order to be healthy? I think the answer is kind of obviously yes. You know, we live in a world where that is our, our, our life is mismatched to our biology in many ways, right? Think about the diseases that are more common today, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancers, um, arthritis, um, osteoporosis, um, depression, anxiety. All of these are much more common today than they were in the past. And we have, and we have good data to show that, right? And by the past, I don't mean actually even that long ago. And most of those diseases, you know, most of the time when somebody walks into a doctor's office for, for a health visit, the vast majority of those visits are for preventable diseases, the vast majority, at least 70% by, by most estimates. And how do you prevent those diseases? Well, I mean, over and over and over and over, it comes down to a few just simple basic things. So apart from not smoking, right, it's diet and exercise. Sleep is also important, of course. Um, you know, so avoiding psychosocial stress is important, but but diet and exercise are obviously fundamental. And we live in a world, however, where we no longer have to be physically active, so we have to exercise. And tell me a bit more about because I think it is really interesting. You've seen you know, the point that you're you're making is that we didn't exercise before; we just had a life where you got um, sort of this activity. So, what are you know? Is there such a thing as a typical hunter-gatherer lifestyle? Is it very clear the sort of activities they did that therefore we need to build? Or is that actually help us to understand? Because you mentioned already that, you know, this thing about like we used to, we carry more. How, can I mean, you draw look, me a bit more of a picture I mean, of what, what, what is this life? Well, people want like? people want a, a, a prescription, right? And that's part of the problem, which is that there is no simple prescription. But people were physically active. They sat, but they didn't sit for long periods of time all the time. They um, They didn't have access to you know, industrially processed foods that had all kinds of, you know, crap added and the fiber removed, et cetera. Um, and, um, and, you know, time after time, if you look at the literature, you know, it, it with, even if you didn't know anything about our hunter-gatherer or farmer ancestors, you'd already know that, right? I mean, who doesn't know that exercise is good for them and not eating, you know, McDonald's every day is good for them? Everybody knows that. The problem is that we live in a world where Again, now physical activity has become optional, and it's less expensive and more easy to buy of um, industrially processed foods that are that are unhealthy. And so people have to now go out of. I mean, I pay more money for food that has less sugar added, 
right? Yeah. <laughs> and I pay more money for foods in which they haven't removed the fiber for it, right? The world has become essentially kind of topsy-turvy. So it does require us to be intentional about how we organize our lives in terms of both physical activity and diet. That's, that's just a sad truth um, to our lives. And there are all these people out there who are trying to make money off our desire to be comfortable, off our desire to have energy-rich food, you know, and um, and we need to figure out how to how to uh, overcome that. You know, everybody I know n l likes, you know, a understands that exercise is good for them. It's just that many of us struggle in order to exercise. And so I think that part of the problem is that we kind of shame and blame them, right? We make them feel bad. They're somehow they're lazy. There's something wrong with them. Yeah, I think that is absolutely sort of the story that we're used to. It's like there's we should do this, and if you're not doing it, it's somehow, is there something wrong with you? Like whether it's a moral failing or a physical failing. And I feel that actually that's got even more so in the culture over the last, um, even like 10 years. Absolutely, that. the physical activity culture is such that, you know, just go do it, right? You know, just do it and all those other, you know. And, 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 and you know, we need to understand that if you, look, if you put couches and, and escalators and, and uh, you know, nice comfy chairs and whatever in the, in the Kalahari Desert, the, the hunter-gatherers there would avail themselves of them just as much as you and I do, right? So we need to find ways to help people help themselves without being dictatorial, you know, without being sort of, um, of you know, fascistic about it. Um, and that means finding ways to help people either make it physical activity necessary or make it rewarding or or both and 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 that's i think our, our our societal challenge and i'd love to talk about that just before we do there were a couple of these myths that i, w I would yeah. love just to just to cover first so one i think you mentioned um at the beginning the quick fire questions about this idea that when you get old you should retire and slow down is that true very much no. So we actually published a paper recently called the Active Grandparent Hypothesis. So you may have heard of the grandparent hypothesis, the idea that humans evolved to be grandparents. Most species, very rarely do individuals live after they've stopped reproducing. Whereas the average human lives about two decades after the end of reproduction, which makes us very unusual by the species. And, and one of the reasons, of course, is that old people impart wisdom. We talked about that earlier. But also, if you go to any um, non, you know, pre-industrial society, the grandparents are out there in the fields digging and farming. The grandparents are out in the hunter-gatherers are out there, you know, digging for food and hunting and providing food for their children and grandchildren. We evolved to stay active all throughout our lives. And, and, and what's important about that is that being active uh, slows the aging process. We can talk about why that is the case, and um, and promotes health, uh, both mental and physical, which thereby enables people to actually live longer. So it's a feedback system. Because remember, until recently, we make a distinction between the health span and lifespan. And until recently, there was no medical system. Right, the doctors didn't exist. Your lifespan was your health span. Right? As soon as you got really sick, you died. Right? What physical activity does, really, it's not so much important for lengthening lifespan, although it does. It's what's really important is it extends your health span by slowing aging and, and turning on repair and maintenance mechanisms that keep your body functioning really well. And so the fact that people evolved to be physically active as they aged actually helped them age so that they could be active grandparents. And I feel a lot of people listening to this are like, I feel like You've slightly blown their mind because I think we are absolutely used to this idea that there's this big distinction between a grandparent and a parent and grandparents definitely are not like going out, you know, in the equivalent of the hunting and digging in the field. It's like, well, you know, you, no, obviously they'll be too frail. They won't be strong enough. That's, that's a different thing. And now if I was thinking back to this hunter gatherer, it'd be like, well, I assume that they sort of sit in the middle of the village and look after the little children so that, you know, the people in their 20s and 30s can go, go out and do these really Nothing physical things. Nothing could be things. further from the truth. So there's a, a wonderful study by a, a anthropologist named Kristen Hawkes who showed that among the Hadza, again, we always go back to the Hadza because they're the, pretty much the best study hunter gatherer group. The grandmothers actually spend more time digging up tubers, you know, food, than the mothers. 
Um, the grandmothers do more digging than the mothers. Yes, because because m- m- mothers are dealing with their children, right? You know, there's a handful, right? Grandma can go off and 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 spend more time. Of course, they also do a lot of childcare and other things like that. They can actually spend more time. They end up digging more tubers. I've seen this myself. Some of these grandmas, like my God, they're like machines. They're like it's hard to keep up with them. They're like digging machines, right? Um, um, so they're actually working harder than the mothers, and of course. Uh, they're not doing it as a form of exercise. They're doing it to help their children and their children and their grandchildren. But here's the thing. It actually helps them. There, there was a, the, the most famous study on exercise and aging was actually done here in Boston at Harvard Medical School by a guy named Ralph Paffenbarger. Uh, he figured out that if you wanted to study aging and exercise, Harvard was actually like the best place on the planet. And the reason for that is that the Harvard Alumni Association, the development office, never lets go of its alums because they're constantly asking them for money. Okay. <laughs> you never, never get left alone. Right? Until the day you die, Harvard will ask you for money. And because of that, he thought, this is perfect. We can f- we can get the Harvard alum, you know, the development office to let us follow a bunch of Harvard alums as they age, find out how they're doing, give them some questionnaire, you know, find out how active they are and whether they smoke and what, et cetera, and then find out effects on aging. And what he showed was, and of course it's been replicated many times, but this is a fu- this is a classic paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Showed that as people get older, the effect of exercise increases their lifespan more. So, for example, Harvard alums who are in the you know, twenty or thirty or forty years old who exercised more than the than the sedentary alums from their same class, they had about a twenty percent lower death rate. Okay. By the time in their sixties or seventies or eighties. The, after, you know, after correcting for other factors, they had a 50% lower death rate. So once you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, the people exercising were having a 50% lower death That's rate correct. than the others. In other words, the other way of saying is that the older you get, the bigger the benefit of exercise is on your longevity. And we, of course, since then, we understand the me- mechanisms behind that. Because every time you exercise, or for that matter, are physically active, climb the stairs, or you know, go dig up some tubers, or carry water instead of turning on the fire, fo- whatever it is you do, right? What what you're doing is you're stressing your body. Okay. Right? Your 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 the muscles are you know getting little tears. Your your the mitochondria in your muscles, those are the little organelles that produce energy. They're actually producing reactive oxygen species. They're actually causing oxidation, like you know when you brown an apple, right? They're producing these little chem- chemicals that are that are reactive, right? You're you're heating up, and so you're you're actually de- you're actually you know changing. You're, you're damaging your proteins. There's a thousand bad things that happen when okay, you so exercise. Okay, so far this sounds bad. You're describing all the bad things that exercise happen when you exercise. Exercise is stressful. Okay. Right? It's a physiological stress. In, okay. And every single system of your body is stressful. However, we evolved to be physically active, right? So for every single one of these stresses, our bodies turn on repair and maintenance mechanisms. So we turn on, we produce antioxidants that mop up all those free radicals, those, those reactive oxygen species. We produce... Uh, proteins and enzymes that get rid of the proteins that have been damaged. We produce enzymes that repair the mutations that are caused in our DNA by the exercise. I mean, I could go on, right? Every single thing you can think about, right, has been natural selection over billions of generations of not just humans, but our ancestors, has produced responses so that it uh, that physical activity isn't damaging for us. It's but actually the reverse. You need to do the physical activity in order to trigger all of these beneficial things. Exactly, parts. because we never evolved not to be physically active. So we never evolved to turn on these mechanisms in the absence of physical activity. And You're we're evolved and our bodies work. Well, obviously, I'll only turn on the, the repair after the damage, and it never imagined that you might be able to go through a whole day without having to do lots of activity and, and set it off. That's, that part of, that's partly. And the other is that, of course, you wouldn't want to... It's very hard to program the body just to repair exactly that damage, right? You tend to overshoot, right? So I, the analogy I often use is like, imagine you spilled your tea on the floor right now and you then cleaned it up. The floor would actually be a little bit cleaner after you cleaned it up, right? Yeah. Because then, then it is right now because it's actually not all that clean, right? So, And that's exactly the same with these repair and maintenance mechanisms. We actually tend to overshoot them. And so the end result is that physical activity isn't bad for us. Otherwise, people who exercise would die younger, right? Instead, we turn on these repair and maintenance mechanisms that actually prevent, that actually, we, that actually, actually improve every aspect of We overdo ourselves. it, which is why exercise slows aging, because you actually slow through these repair and maintenance mechanisms, the aging process. 